Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Well, so Mark Clifton has decided to kick up some dirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. I just want to make sure that that's understood. I'm Dan Hurst, and we have a very special guest today. I, I'm really excited. To, I've been looking forward to this, actually, for, for several days, uh, knowing that that was a possibility. And so I'm really glad you're here. Please introduce him, Mark. This is this, this yeah. is this is yeah. this is Andy Addis, ladies and ladies gentlemen. And gentlemen. Yes. Uh, he is absolutely a saxophone player extraordinaire. <laughs> Don't go right? there. No, you play. I play. You play. I play yes. You play. With, and and yes. he owns uh, the uh, one of the original Ataris. I do. With how many games? Uh, over a hundred original games. Oh. <laughs> But you don't have four puppets hanging on you your You don't wall. have four puppets. I have four puppets. Which Hamilton, is an advantage, I Joe, think. Joe, Frank, and Reynolds. Those are my four puppets. Well, I, I, I've seen them online. Yes. I yeah. <laughs> No, you you actually play. I mean, you play very well. He plays jazz, and you play uh, you play in the Hutchinson Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, that was actually a couple of years ago. I got uh, this was such a strange and horrible thing. They sent me some sheet music and said, "Could you play this for the Christmas?" Thing? Uh-huh. I, I'm sure. So yeah. I listened to the recording. I learned it. Yeah. Got there, asked where I was sitting, and they go, "Oh, you don't sit." I thought, "Well, that's strange." Yeah. Did not realize it was a solo. Oh boy! Oh my goodness! Where you stood next to the director, so literally at the dress rehearsal, I found out that it was a. I thought oh. I was playing as a part of a pit crew, uh-huh. but no. Yeah. It, and so we have video of that. It's the highlight of my saxophone that is playing awesome. career, well, and it was all accidental. At the end of it. <laughs> at the end of it. All right. Well, Andy Addis, pastor to church in seminary, and then God called you to back to Kansas. You're Kansan. That's right. Sixty uh, miles love, from where I graduated. We love Kansas. Amen we love and amen. Kansas. Do. Yeah, I don't care if nobody. Else moves there. I like it just like it is. Yeah, they call it flyover country, and if you call it that, I'm just saying keep flying. Keep yeah. flying over. <laughs> yeah. We don't we don't need yeah. you here. Oh, I love it. I love the open sky, the big spaces. You know, I was in um, uh, Tennessee just a couple weeks ago, yeah. and all that kudzu and switchback roads, yeah, I was yeah, feeling a little claustrophobic. Oh, me yeah. I need to get back home. To get me skies. back home. Yeah. So you are Kansan. Grew, mm-hmm. grew up around Hutchinson, didn't you? In Great Bend. In yeah. Great Bend. Yeah. That's right. You know Great Bend, that's, that's where... Uh, what was the DeSoto? Was that who it was? Who no? Who was the Spanish? Coronado. Coronado. Yeah. He came all the way up from Mexico, went as far as Great Bend, saw the beauty of Great Bend, and said nothing could be better than this, and went back to Mexico. Is that kind of how that goes? <laughs> well, that's the way we tell the story anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Say what I find amazing is it's the Great Bend of the Arkansas River, uh-huh. and uh, if you uh, there was a day that we actually whitewater rafted the Arkansas River and Royal Gorge, and then drove <laughs> all the way back home and walked over it. <laughs> in Great Bend. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, so you grew up in Great Bend, then you went to seminary and all that. But you come back to Hutchinson. Yes. What year was that? Two thousand and two. And you went where? Uh, Church. Came, uh, went to yeah. Westbrook Baptist Church, a uh, church that was planted by First Southern of Hutchinson yeah. in 19, August 23rd, 1970, which I always like to bring up because that makes the church almost a year older than me. Okay. <laughs> so this church was planted in 70, and you went in 2000? In two. In two. What was the church like when you got there? Well, it had its heyday in the 90s, and it was run. It was a three-phase building program with an octagonal worship center. You know, there was a time carpet. where they all built those octagonal worship with orange carpet, right? That's it. That's it. I can picture that in my mind right that's now. That's why I bring it up because you know the 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 inside of the ark upside down. You can see that on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> and the burn orange carpet, and they, they were running about 400 back in the day, yeah. uh, but they had they had dwindled. They'd been without a pastor for a couple years, and were down in worship was 80 or 90 somewhere around there. I think they claimed about 100 and 120, uh, but it that was a good day All for right. them back then. So what we're talking about now is multi-site worship. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's one of those polarizing topics. Either people, maybe some people are in the middle, but there are some people on both sides of this. And I think particularly those who have a lot of problems with it or opposed to it, have some issues theologically and all that stuff with it. Other people who are very pragmatic about it and say this. And and so it's you can put people in a room together and throw out something like multi multi-site uh, churches, and you get a variety of opinions. Mm, that's a nice way to say it. But you did not show up at Westbrook Hulch and say, we're going to do a bunch of multi-site stuff. 
So unpack for us how you came to where you are, and then tell us where you are. Tell us what's going on right now. You've, I've heard this story. It's a great story. Everybody just sit back, get a cup of coffee, and listen to this. It's really a great story. <laughs> well, let me just uh, unwrap it like you said. And um, right now, I'll tell you the end, and then we'll go back to the beginning. I am a video – I lead, as the lead teaching and vision pastor, a video-driven rural multi-site. So as an introvert, if I ever want to be left alone, that's what I tell people because no, <laughs> no. one of those three terms is going to keep people from wanting to have a conversation. <laughs> They're going to be mad about something, aren't <laughs> that's they? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but when we went, it was uh, it was a declining neighborhood church, sweet people. Um, but the truth is that it was uh, it was on its death spiral uh, by every account that you can uh, measure it. And um, in 2002, they took a chance on a young pastoral guy with two little kids, and we moved home. And the truth is that we just started with a simple plan, which was preach the Bible, Mm -hmm. um, highly relational, and a big vision. And uh, so we just started preaching through books of the Bible, did a lot of chicken dinners. And by the way, chicken dinners, Mm -hmm. uh, so important, but it did reveal some things about my family because my my, they asked what Nathan would eat. I said, well, yeah, he'll do chicken, and then he wouldn't eat at this senior adult house. I'm like, what is wrong with you? And he goes, Dad, it has bones. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) man. And that's when I realized we give that kid far too many nuggets. <laughs> but, but, but we would do a lot of volleyball games, a lot of chicken dinners, preaching out of the Bible. And then we just said we wanted to reach 10% of the community. And it was a, it was a big vision that caused people to sit up and take notice. And anyway, long story short, I'm not taking any credit for this. Everything that we can say that we could teach somebody else, we learned in the rearview mirror. Okay. It was all that God had done it. We rode a bull. You ride a bull for eight seconds, you win. Okay. Right? That's, <laughs> that, that's all we did. But as we look back, uh, when we first started, we went from about a handful of people to almost 300 in the first year. Hmm. Uh, and then the second year, we're running close to a little over 500, decided we need to build a building. Mm-hmm. And um, then we looked at building a building and said, oh, we're blue collar rural. We ain't ever going to build a building. Right. Uh, so we bought a, an old Big A auto parts store five minutes across town, cut a hole in the wall, called it a coffee shop, put a stage in the corner. So that's the worship center. Mm-hmm. And uh, we started doing worship in another place on Saturday night. We prayed for 50 people to come over and be a part of that, out of the 500. And the first night, 270 were there. And we prayed Mm -hmm. those 50 people would go back. (laughs) Uh, Within a year and a half, uh, we're running 1,000 in -hmm. these two locations. And we're just, you know, we're small. We're we're a big rural community because we have the Walmart. For right. all the all the the towns around, right. but but a thousand people coming to worship was crazy. We noticed that about two hundred plus were coming from a city twenty minutes away, so we asked them, "Can we do the same thing over there uh, in your high school gym?" They said yes, and that's when somebody I'm gonna I'm gonna sound so stupid, but this is this is the gospel truth. Somebody said, "Oh, you're multi-site," and I said. We're what? <laughs> and they told me about a book, Multi-Site Revolution. Uh-huh. I remember I read it voraciously over a weekend, came to my staff on Monday and said, we have a people. <laughs> <laughs> We're not the only ones doing this. Um, and so we just started to grow. Long story short, um, we started not only planting where we knew we had some influence, but we started revitalizing some churches that were declining in our local association. Uh, so here we are since 2002. Uh, we are now running 13 locations. We have about 3,000, 3,500 in attendance. Uh, and our largest campus runs about 1,500. Our smallest campus runs about 20. So we have everything in between. And we have full-time, BIVO, volunteer staff. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And our whole purpose is that we want to take churches into places where most likely if they weren't a part of a network, if they weren't supported, they just that community couldn't have a church. So most of your uh, satellite campuses, that's probably not the right word to use, most of your, your campuses are, they're all video venue, right? Well, yeah, the, the teaching is video. That's, okay, unpack that but, for us a little bit. Yeah, uh, so, and that's one of the pushbacks. I don't want a cardboard pastor. Well, you don't. Every location has a pastor. Matter of fact, we won't start a location without a leader. It needs to have a leader. It's just really hard to get a, a good preaching pastor to give their life with their $30,000 of seminary debt to Waukini, Kansas. I got you. you. You understand what I'm saying? But in Waukini, there are godly men who have a pastoral heart. They're usually cops. They're usually teachers. And and we can train them. And if they're in a network where they don't have to 
pay the bills because central services is doing that, and they don't have to file the insurance paperwork because somebody's doing that for them. All they have to do is pastor. Then we can find those guys and train them up. And and then here's what we do. We take a guy who normally is spending half his week as a minister to books getting a sermon ready, and he's got 40 hours a week now that he can just love on the community and disciple and this and that. Yet, even though they don't like it, we do make them preach every other month. They have to preach six or seven times a year. Okay. And if they get a bug and they really like it, then we want them to preach a Wednesday night service. Or okay. you know, they, they have some context where they can do that. So we, we have them do that. And as they do it, they all preach the same message mm-hmm. because we preach in series. And then we work on it, and it's big staff development. Here's what I know. Once every other month, there's a week that nothing gets done because all we do is <laughs> sermon development. <laughs> Just the, everything grinds to a halt because all we're going to do is work on sermon development. So week to week uh, – 13 locations or 14 if you count the, the mother church, the mother church? It's the 13 uh, as, as we're adding. Uh, it's four. I believe, okay, 13, I hate 14. This. Right. But we also count uh, Crosspoint Inside, which is our prison ministry, and it's in, it's in multiple locations, but okay. we only count it okay. as one. So all of those are basically video teaching. Yes. And you're, you're, you, whoever is at the, the main campus, it's the video. And uh, right now you do that in a very high-quality way, right? I mean, you, 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 it sends out, it's great. And everybody's watching the same thing mm-hmm. at the same time. Not at the same time. We're committed at the broadcast center. Uh, we have, all, we're, we're Baptist Catholics because we have Saturday Night Mass. Okay. <laughs> uh, because in rurality, you can't stream anything out there. You get That's the spinning true. beach ball of death. And uh, <laughs> I have never frozen in a in a glorifying position. So wherever you froze, it looks. <laughs> it looked like I was physically ill every <laughs> every time. So we record on Saturday nights. We oh. have a Saturday night service, and then it's uploaded so that they can download it by 10 p.m. every Saturday night, and that way they have a hard copy and they're not dealing with streaming. Now issues. you mentioned the broadcasts. What did you call that? We call it the broadcast center because in our network, I need this, like I said, some, a, a location of 15 and a location of 1500. Mm-hmm. But we're uh, we're not a church with satellites because a church with satellites is the mothership. That's and the what mothership, I, was I, knew, I was gonna say the mothership, and I know you didn't use that term. Well, because the mothership always becomes the Death Star, and no. Nobody likes the Death Star. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we are not a church with uh, satellites. We are a church of satellites. Okay. And, and so literally, uh, you can come to one of our staff meetings, and the pastor of 1500, which is a mega church pastor, mm-hmm. and the pastor of 15, they're sitting at the same table, having the same conversation. We're contributing to the same ministry and the same vision. It's beautiful. We, we don't have those dividing lines. Um, and so the, the church that I preach at is the broadcast center because that's their responsibility. But the there's another location that that's central services. That's where all of the... Yeah, I heard you mention central services, and I didn't know what that was. That is everything that is done corporately. And by the way, we call it the Costco effect. That's how you can help these small churches. Let me give you an example. Um, we just took on Liberal as a, as a replant, uh, a revitalization replant. They, they, they were with us for four years before they came on board. Because they were one of those churches that was born during the oil boom in mm-hmm. Kansas. Mm-hmm. And all these Southerners came up. They have an entire city block, a three-court, full-court basketball gymnasium, an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Mm. I mean, just – th- they have every- – well, it was in disrepair. And the, um, the, the bills for insurance on that were just through the roof. And we couldn't take them on because we couldn't handle it. But then we discovered – we're already basically maxed because of all the – we're church mutual. If they came on board, from several thousand dollars a month, their insurance payment went down to $180. Wow. Because we're doing it corporately. Gotcha. Now, a mat, and so they're a part, and they, I think they've tripled in size in the last year, and, and God's doing some great things there. But so many things, children's curriculum, uh, buying of janitorial supplies, whenever we can do this in bulk, anything we can do in bulk. We produce bulletins in bulk. We take care of finances in bulk. We do all of our accounting and our insurance work in bulk, and that all those things then come through central services. It's not only a cost difference, uh, which is very substantial, but then it frees the pastors up because they don't have to do any okay. of that stuff. I, I'm, get, I'm getting some picture of it now. You where got a are question? they housed? Where, where is like central services? Central services is at our Salina so. location, which is uh, about 60 miles away from the broadcast center. Uh, and um, and that's where they do all. all there's a, a whole team. The actual office space at Salina, half the building is central service and half the building is the Salina staff. And how many, how many does it staff? Oh, I, you're, you're going to catch me on this. I could guess. Here's what I know. For the entire network, for all locations, when we get together, and that's our full-time staff, part-time staff, and volunteer staff, 
um, it's just under a hundred mm. to to run the whole network. Right, and you're in in thirteen locations. Mm-hmm. Um, do you ever get all get together at one time? It's the most wonderful time of the year. Ah. <laughs> yes, uh, we, we we have weekly meetings with our pastors online. So there's, you know, we can talk about the rural big three. We want to we want to battle isolation and vocational identity, right. um, and so we meet every Tuesday. Our lead team, uh, which are the guys leading central services, I meet with them right after that meeting every Tuesday as well, and we meet together uh, twice a month and, and online the other two times a month, and then we get together twice a year. Uh, with location pastors, and once a year, the most glorious time of the year, we do what they call all staff retreat, mm-hmm. and we get together, and for three days, we meet, and we plan, and we worship, and we even serve. We always do service projects in the community, and it is just, it, according to our staff, they say it's the best thing that we do. They just love getting together to see each other. We cast vision. We set the themes for the year. It's really a lot of fun. And you, as the main teaching pastor, you do visit the other campuses from time to time. Yeah, I, I try and get there. uh, uh on a regular basis, uh-huh. but what I what we don't do is we establish this. When I don't want to go on a weekend and then preach because what you don't want to do is communicate if you're a video driven multi site that this is better than that. So on occasion, when I have been there on a on a Sunday, I actually sit and watch myself, and that is the most painful thing <laughs> that you could ever do. Is to not, uh, watching yourself is hard. Try watching yourself. From the pew with a church <laughs> surrounding you, uh, but yeah, yeah. Like I said, we, we'll try and go a, and make those connections. And, and when I, I'm the primary teacher, I'm the lead teaching a vision pastor. But out of 52 weekends a year, I preach 38, uh, because our location pastors preach six or seven times a year, and then uh, we have a teaching team of some guys who teach centrally, like I do, another five or six times a year. So it, it's really we have a lot of voices uh, of kind of an eldership. Speaking and all of these, all these uh, campuses are basically what you would call in in rural America. I mean, Salina is fifty thousand people, but that's your largest. Well, are you in Topeka now? Uh, yes, we Topeka's are. Topeka is hundred thousand people, but no, 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 no cities at all, right? No, no, no. Well, and and you know, little places from from Liberal to Concordia. Yeah, we're out in Hayes. We're yeah. in Ellsworth. Right. Uh, we're launching in Russell in a couple weeks, right. which which will be great. But out of that, you know, you and I have had this conversation a few times. You say, well, big or little. Actually, rurality is a mentality, mm. and so there are there are a lot smaller places that are very cosmopolitan, mm-hmm. and there are a lot bigger places that are very rural. Right. Uh, and so what we do is we, we focus on a rural mentality. That that's who we like to reach. All right. Well, I, I know you well. You are rural. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's okay, Alm- almost hillbilly. All right. Now let's talk about this. All right. So you believe that multi-site is the only way to go, and it's the only hope for the future. Is that right? I'm glad you're sitting six feet away, so I, I can't reach you right now. No, uh, I think you're baiting me because you've heard I, me say this before. I am baiting you. Yes. Um, uh, here's what I tell you: rural, video-driven, multi-site. That's what we are, and we are that because God's called us to that. I don't think it is the way to do this. I don't even think it's the best way to do this. I think it's a way to do this. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we had all the money and all the men that we needed, and we could establish autonomous churches that could just exegete the community and exist uh, and thrive on their own, that would be great. But where we're going and the things that we're doing, God's calling us to places where they're probably not going to have that. And so yet you say, well, you got some that could, and that some, those are mission outposts. We want everybody to have at least grandchildren in church planting. So these larger locations that are in the bigger rural communities can plant in these smaller places. For instance, Russell that's going to open up, it's mm-hmm. got a team of five or six families that are all driving up from Hutchinson until they get established. And that's a good 90 minutes, one way uh, to get this started. They've been doing it all summer, retrofitting a building, this and that, um, to, to make sure that it's going. So th- to answer quite distinctly, no, this isn't the best way. It is the way that God has called us to do this. And I like my way of doing this better than somebody's way of not doing it at all. And oh, so that's what go. that's what we're doing. All right. Well, that's awesome. And I appreciate it. And I know, Andy, you would be glad to talk to anybody about multi-site and all of those kinds of things. But you're right. It's yeah. not a silver bullet. It doesn't – it's not no. just a magic thing. It, it, I love your story. And the reason I wanted you to be on here and talk about it is because you hear how organically it came to be. Mm-hmm. It's not like you sit down and go, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to map it out. We're going to do all this. We're going to grow this network. Hmm. It, it's It's how you respond to needs in rural America where if you didn't do that, nothing would be done. That's right. That's right. And and I just have this heart. For whatever reason, 
I, I grew up in Great Bend, went to college in Hayes, and was a youth pastor. And you and my youth pastor budget was sixty dollars a year, <laughs> which was a five pound bag of M and M's every month, and that's what I bought. <laughs> and we would have to wash cars and mow yards to go to a to see Michael W. Smith in, in, in Wichita, Wichita. Yeah, right. yeah, and you'd have to drive two and a half three hours to get there. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be great if you could do ministry right here and not have to always go somewhere else to do the stuff? that you saw other churches doing. And it's not that you need it. The Holy Spirit's more than enough. But if you could create a network that made life easier, then you could do ministry better. And that's really what we're trying to do. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about how the individual churches connect with their communities apart from from your centralized position. Yeah, you know, the central services, we, we used to call them, I think we still do at some level, Crosspoint um, Constants. So there are very few things that are, these are the things that have to happen at every location because those locations, that we, we don't Starbucks anything, right? We have, a, we have a common branding and we have a common verbiage and we have a common mission and vision. But outside of that, we want location pastors to be able to exegete their community. So let me give you a a common thing to let to, to just describe this. Vacation Bible school. Now there's something else. You drop that out there, you're going to divide the room depending mm-hmm. on what, you know, where you come from and what you think about that. So in Hutchinson, Kansas, we don't do vacation Bible school because it was a good activity, but it was what what our children's pastors told us was it was basically just Every Christian family in town was rotating their family through all the vacation yeah. Bible schools. Yeah. And so it wasn't really moving the kingdom forward as far as we could tell. In um, Great Bend, uh, they have a vacation Bible school that is the key event of the summer. And it is for their servants and for the children. And they move the ball downfield when they do vacation Bible school. They pour lots of time and energy into that. In Sterling, Kansas... Uh, it's not so much about the Vacation Bible School, but there's a community Vacation Bible School that they participate in. And because of the strength of the church there, they have helped lead that in the past, lead the whole city. And it's an ecumenical wonder there. And what we need to make sure is that we have enough space for our location pastors to lead style of music. You know, we got a couple of locations that Highlanders are the team mascot. And they play bagpipes. Mm. To them, brings a tear to their eye if you mm-hmm. play some bagpipes. It brings a tear to my eye, too, but not for the same reasons. You know what I mean? Uh, if you a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll, you know, if you got a lot of college students, you want to do sad and sweaty worship, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever is working for, for you, that we need the location pastor to be able to exegete the community and, and really meet them and the community at that level. So each individual church decides its own style of worship and its own um, approach to the community and to build that network within the community? Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to say it's just a free for all because the, we we have some parameters and and there are things that we say and, and a lot of it is not just here we need you to do this a lot of it is resource based. Here's what we have for you. Mm-hmm. So we kind of center around those resources. But yes, if there is a need, if there is a specific thing that that community responds to, then you must do that thing. Uh, like all of our grow groups, every location uh, has has grow groups in lieu of Sunday school. And we write our own material for that. We shoot our own videos for that. And that keeps costs down. And, and if you're part of our net, even if you're not part of our network, we, we give that stuff away for free. Um, but in doing that, part of the, the grow group process is that they would adopt a ministry. Well, what ministry? It's whatever that community has, whatever that – and it's very unique depending on what – there are six educators in this group. Well, let's minister to this school. Well, there's a bunch of people from the hospital here. What if we did this thing with uh, the hospital? Gotcha. And uh, and they – not just the church, but even the grow groups are very much exegeting their culture. So if you look at it, on, on there's a lot of things that you do that just really build up the body of Christ because the, the local people who are serving there, the campus pastors, all those folks, you got all kinds of equipping to give them, support to give them. Let's say there's a, you know, there's something tragic happens in that town, that, that campus pastor is not going to be on his own. You've got other pastors that will come around him and serve with him, all that kind of stuff. You mentioned the, 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 the uh, Central Services Center where mm-hmm. you can do all of that, uh, helping do sermon preparation together, all these great things. And and we, we definitely can see that. And the main same time, 
I know there are people listening going, yeah, but, you know, I don't mm-hmm. believe this about multi-site. I don't believe that about multi-site. And they've got all these reasons. Probably – and, I've, you know, some of them are, are very valid in that. But I just love what you said uh, and how you said that so many times. You're not here saying this is the only way or even the best way. It's a way. That's right. And That's right. Uh, I want you to know that Andy, through all the years I've known him, has been a target – uh, for many people who don't even know Andy and what he does. They yep. just know here's a church in Kansas that has, you know, 14 locations, all video preaching, and how bad that is. And even one time, you were featured, and don't give the name, but you were featured in a major publication, correct? Yes. Yeah, well, this is really funny because I get that pushback all the time. Yes. And so I had a friend say, you got to check out this article. It's a, it's about uh, how bad video preaching. I'm like, I'm not checking it out. I've had enough this week. Yeah. He's like, no, you got to check. And this, this text string just went back and yeah. forth. He goes yeah. like, dude, please, for me, take five minutes and check it out. So I did. I went to this website, and I looked at this, and I'm reading the article. I'm thinking, yeah, it says the same thing it always says. And I went, wait. The graphic was a picture of me on a screen at one of our locations. And I'm like, thank you. This is gold. I screenshotted it. I hyperlinked it. I sent it to everybody. I said, this is the best ever. Because it basically, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, it was like, why the devil would use video preaching? It was, it was that bad. So regardless of what you think about it, and we'll do some other podcasts about it, I want you to know that Andy has maintained a great, great sense of, of, of compassion and joy and not vitriol. I mean, you just, it's been great to see you respond that way. Yeah. And, and I hope that that's, I hope that that's true. Uh, let me tell you that what 2020 did with the COVID shutdown uh-huh. is I have heard so much less of that noise since then. Oh yeah, I bet. Because once everybody got shut down and everybody had to go online, everybody had to do all this, it was, it was a little different because we spent the first three weeks of the shutdown helping church after church giving away equipment and training in them and how to do X, Y, and Z. And there was a little bit where it was a couple times I'm like, oh, so now you want to <laughs> But But we now, <laughs> since then, ever since 2020, that there's been a lot less conversation about right. that. Now, we're going to put this in the show notes, but if people, <coughs> people want to come, don't you have something you that you do on a regular basis, annually you used to, where people can come and learn about how this works? A- absolutely. We're Actually, we're firing it up again because we get so many people who say, hey, can you show us how to do this? Can we come be a part of this? We're going to focus. I, I, we used to call them hitchhiker events, but I don't know what we're going to call them now. But we're going to have three times a year, at least twice, where groups can come in and we're going to be set up to walk you through the paces. We'll come to a recording night and mirror whoever you want to mirror. Then go out to one of our satellites or one of the venue locations and or lo- campus locations and and see what's going on. Then come back and we'll debrief and, and start a relationship. Because our desire isn't to – there's two ways to view multi-site. One is to expand your church and one is a missiology of church planting. Okay, say that again. The two ways to view multi-site. And neither one of them are wrong. Right, but they're two different approaches. Yeah, one is to say, okay, we're too big for this space and it's better for us to space out. And that's to grow your church. And that's a good thing. You should want to grow your church. That, 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 if there's oxen, there, then there's going to be a large harvest, right. uh, Proverbs 14.4. Right. Um, but there's another approach, and this is what we do, that we consider multi-site not necessarily church expansion, but a missiology of church planting. This is how we can plant churches okay. in rural places and know that they have a, sus- a sustainability rate. And frankly, rural America, and this is a whole other podcast. Well, you do a podcast. We'll put the link to your podcast. You do a rural pastor podcast. Rural America is one of the most underreached areas of all of North America. You told me one time, if you live outside of the South and you live in rural America— it's as unchurched as our major metropolitan cities in the East and in the West. Absolutely. It is incredibly wow. unchurched. Wow. Well, just one example, like the Pacific Northwest has a church. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of big cities, Seattle and Portland, mm-hmm. right? right? You know, maybe Eugene. Uh, but but you get up in the Pacific Northwest, and it's less than 4% church. Right. I mean, that's at a global right. level, that's, that's, that's unchurched. And what is our church planting strategy in towns of, of 600 – where the nearest evangelical church might be four or five hours away. Seriously, that's mm-hmm. altogether a possibility. Absolutely. And so that's that's one of the things you're looking at and one of the reasons this is taking place. And the replant, replant revitalization efforts, the, the whole reason this podcast exists is because a dying church doesn't give glory to God, right, in right. this. And and what you're doing, when, when, a, when an evangelical church dies in a county of 12,000 people, there may not be – it's not like in a city where – 
a church dies, and then, well, you have to dr- drive an extra three blocks. Right. There right. may not be anything for two hours. That's right. And so even though you may not like their style or their brand, they're a needed presence right. in that place, and that's why they're worth saving. All right, man. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it, Andy. Thank you, Andy. It's uh, It's been so good to, to have you on the show. I've been wanting to do this for a long, long time, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate uh, your ministry out there in, in western Kansas. <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, and we'll be back again with another episode. We'll probably have an episode yeah. on our next episode. We hope you'll join us then. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.